I have to say, what you're doing is spectacular. It is a challenge for our generation. We're reaching a point where compulsorily we must act. If you're working with the music community in a big way to, to help get your message out there. I feel music can move more people than anything else. Every success to you, I wish you all the luck. Don't wish me success, this is not my planet, this is our planet. I wish us success then. Namaskaram, good morning to you. Where are you all guys? London, is it? London, London here, London oh, here. So good afternoon. <laughs> good afternoon. Nice uh, meeting you, Mr. Heno, sir. You know, how do I say that? Do you know? You know, yeah, that's right. Nice to meet you as well. Sadhguru, he asked me. Hey, the same Pete. Question. How are you, man? Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Nice to see you again. So, um, yeah, well, welcome both of you. I'm really looking forward to this conversation today. I think I sent Eno, Brian, a, a book of yours, the Inner Engineering book during the pandemic, and he he was quite taken by it. And, um, and Brian was the uh, founder of Earth Percent, um, a charity providing a, a simple way for the music industry to support the most impactful organizations addressing the climate emergency. So I thought, obviously, you two should meet. Thank you. Good idea. It's, it's a pleasure to meet you, sir. Yeah, I saw your your very nice film um, today, the soil save the soil film. Oh, okay. So, well, well done on that project. That looks really good, and I can't I can't wait to see more films of you on a motorbike. <laughs> well, I have to say, what you're doing is spectacular enough to oh, no. get some kind of attention. I think, <laughs> and I I really hope it does get a lot of attention. It'll get attention. The thing is, uh, we have uh, written a policy document. Uh, kind of, uh, you know, one is a general document, another thing is for every country, 192 countries, we have written a policy document as to how, depending on the latitudinal position, the soil type and uh, climatic conditions and economic conditions of a given nation and also agricultural traditions because you can't yeah. change agricultural, tra agricultural traditions overnight, even uh, if everything else is right. So, taking this into consideration, specific documents for every nation, we have done it. It's taken a lot of work for our scientific group. And fortunately, the UN scientists have been working with us, both from uh, W, uh, I mean, the World Food Program, UNCCD, and also senior scientists from uh, FAO have been working with us. With their help, we developed this document, which we will be handing over to all the heads of state across the world. And we've also written to 730 political parties in the world, saying that we will move 3 to 3.5 billion, billion people or maybe up to 4 billion people. And uh, they must be ready that in their election manifestos, in their party manifestos, they have to include soil and ecology as an important part of their agendas. A time has come for that. Yes, of course. What are the, what are the simple action points? that you ask a government, what are the first things a government can do or do you'll be looking for them to do? See, uh, right now already, fortunately, UK government has acted about a month ago that they are giving uh, some kind of subsidy for cover crops during winter, which will do wonders for the soil. Uh, cover crops were natural part of agriculture in the world, in most parts of the world. In tropical climates, in summer, we, have to, we had uh, cover crops. In uh, temperate climates, winter cover crops were very normal. But in the last fifty years, everybody has forgotten about this. They think by just plastering the place with little more chemicals, everything will happen. So now giving subsidy for the cover crop is a good movement. We've been pushing these things everywhere. And also United States just about fifteen days ago announced one billion dollars for encouraging cover crops. One billion dollars is not enough for the United States, but at least they've started. They will begin to understand that a cover crop is a vital thing, that you plow the land and leave it open to the thing. This is damaging the, uh, the bioactivity within the soil, the organic content that is there, which matures with the microbial activity, is being seriously damaged because the machines are plowing anywhere between 12 to 14 inches these days, and you leave the soil open. And most of the life, I would say 87 percent of the life on this planet is a reflection or a consequence of what is there in the first twelve to fifteen inches of soil, the microbial life 
That is what makes all of us, even in the evolutionary scale of things, we are a kind of a consequence of what is happening in the fifteen inches of soil, but that is being ripped apart. You know, in uh, tropical countries where we're using the soil for twelve months of the year, See, in temperate climates, they may be using only for six months in a year or seven months in a year. But here, twelve months of the year, we are doing crops. Here, we are talking about giving subsidies for resting and recouping the land. Let's say somebody has hundred acres, fifty acres if you give subsidy this year, these fifty acres in a tropical climate, you can do six crops in the year without taking the yield, just plowing it back, plowing it back, or just putting it back and it builds humus into such a way, within one year's time, with six crops in twelve months' time, we can put back at least three to four percent of organic content. For example, in India, I'm saying, the organic content in Indian soil, sixty-two percent of the soil has only less than point five percent. This is on the verge of becoming a desert. Most of the European nations, southern European nations have just one point two percent. Northern Europe has around 2%, 2.1% like this on an average. In a temperate climate, 1% is considered desertification because temperate climate doesn't have the same amount of biological activity as tropical soils have. So the standards are different, but everywhere it's the same problem. The story is same. Uh, it may be finding different versions in different places. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have you been... Have you been talking to farmers very much as well? With the Kaveri Basin, that's a river basin in southern India, here we are doing an active project for last twenty-four hours where we have converted hundreds of thousands of farmers into uh, tree-based agriculture. But in the global scape, we are only aiming at policy change. Why policy change is important is, see for example, the newer parts of uh, London city or around, uh, let's say in UK itself, now there is a law, if you have uh, ten thousand square feet of land in the city, you cannot build ten thousand square, fe square feet of building. You're allowed to build maybe six, seven thousand and remaining some space for yourself, your neighbor is a must. But if you go to the old parts of the city, they've built in such a way, there is no concept of a window, because houses are just right next to each other. When did this happen? This happened when there were no laws about how to construct your homes or your buildings. So similarly, in agricultural lands, what's happened now is anywhere in the world, unfortunately, there are no laws. If you have ten acres of land, you can plow every inch of it. In ten, fifteen years' time, you can make a desert out of it. There is no law to tell you, you cannot do this. But we need to understand, soil is not our property. Soil is a legacy that's come to us. In its living condition, it must go to the next generation, this is most important. Today, every... Uh, every study shows that we are actually eating up the soil of the unborn child. Not even the population that's here, we are eating up the uh, soil that belongs to a future generation that is yet to be. Uh, in my opinion, this seems like a crime that we are committing, a serious crime we are committing against humanity, because uh, every responsible scientist is pointing out by 2045, we'll be producing forty percent less food and our populations will be over nine billion. That's not a world you want to live in. That's not a world where you want to leave your children and go. Yes. Yes, well, you're making a very good case for this. <laughs> I'm impressed by the figures that you have at your fingertips. Um, but the... I think one of the interesting things is that certainly in Europe, I don't know about the rest of the world, but in Europe there is a movement now among farmers to rethink the way that they're looking at their land because yes. they're getting fed up of just putting more and more fertilizer on every year. In fact, they can't make a living because they have to spend so much money on fertilizers. So there's there's now a rethinking going on, and part of that rethinking is, is to do with no-till agriculture, so that we're not digging up and exposing mm -hmm. the earth every year. Yes. Um, and in fact, not only is there a movement among farmers, but among some consumers anyway, there's also a sort of feeling of we have some responsibility for it. You know, if we, if we buy cheaply produced food, namely food that is produced um, unsustainably, then we're partly responsible for what happens to the soil. You know, it's not something we can look away from. 
So there is some sort of a beginning of a mm -hmm. revolution in that, I think. It definitely is happening, especially in Europe, it's definitely happening. Not much in Asia, it is happening here also in a very small way, not significant enough. In United States, it's not at all happening. But what I'm saying is, we have reached a point where the loss of biodiversity per year, according to FAO, they say per year, uh, we are losing on an average about 27,000 species of microbes. I'll repeat that, 27,000 species, not organisms or something. That much spe that many species are going extinct per year. If we go at this pace, in another 30 to 40 years, we will reach a point where if we want to turn the soil around, it will take 150 to 200 years because that much loss in biodiversity has happened. But right now, we are at a cusp of time where if we act now, in the next 10 to 15 or 20 years' time, we can make a significant turnaround. In that sense, it is a challenge for our generation. It is also a privilege of our generation that we are able to turn back from the brink. But I feel this will not happen with farmers wanting to do, individual farmers wanting to do. It's very good what they're doing, but I'm yeah, saying yeah. we need a policy so that this is the way to do agriculture must come in everywhere. Initially with incentives, with encouragements and awareness, but uh, as things get bad, it has to become mandatory. Yes. Well, I think one of the things that's interesting about the whole climate change crisis is the, realize, the realization that we could turn this emergency into a way of making a new and better world. Yes. We have to make these changes. We don't have a choice. It's that or we go extinct. And I think in realizing this, you think, well, actually, it would be better anyway to live in a world where indigenous people were respected for their knowledge, where we looked after soil, where animals had some sort of status and dignity. All of those things are things that we might want anyway, just because they feel better. But now I think we're in a situation where we'll have to do those things. And I, I think as you were saying, of course, we have to, this has to be enshrined in legislation. Legislation really makes a difference mm -hmm. because, it's, because it's hard to argue against. You know, once it's there, it becomes the sort of benchmark with, through which people decide their actions. And I think we're on the edge of that. There's quite a lot of discussions going on about the idea of giving physical and natural entities like rivers, mountains, landscapes, a legal status so that they, their rights can be defended in court, if you like. Um, a river can take you to court for, <laughs> for, for polluting it. I know that sounds a bit ridiculous. Of course, it would be a river represented by a human lawyer. But speaking on that, on that entity's behalf, you know, as a legal entity, so, uh, we're working on a little bit now. Brian, uh, I very much appreciate the intent behind all these movements. But what I'm saying is we've reached a place where if there is no clear law that this is the way to conduct the land, if there is no law, it'll be too late. There should be no room for a case because this is the way to manage a river. This is the way to manage the soil. This has to become a law. And like in a city, how you build your home, there is a law. There has to be a law how we do farming, otherwise uh, the time for this raising the, you know, farmer's conscience, consci consciousness and then turning it around, there is no such luxury time anymore. We're reaching a point where we need to act compulsory, compulsorily we must act. Well, we cannot enforce everything, so it has to be worked with incentives or, uh, you know, some punitive action, both will be needed, otherwise we can't turn around the agricultural lands in the world. See, people do not know this, everybody always try to hit the industry and urbanization. Yes, they also cause their damage, I'm not saying no, I'm not saying it's not significant. But ninety percent of the deforestation has happened because of agriculture, not because of industry, not because of urbanization. Yeah, yeah, that's true, yes. Um, my, my feeling is that, of course, everything you just said is true but also it's just good sense to try to bring as much of the population with you as you can so that mm -hmm. the pressure comes not only from legislation downwards, but from farmers upwards, from people upwards saying we want to change. 
because politicians are incredibly reluctant to make any kind of change if there's any risk involved. So they have to be told the risk is not to make the change. In a democratic uh, nation, the only currency that flies is numbers. This is why we are trying to move 3.5 to uh, 4 billion people. This is 60% of the world's electorate. 5.26 billion people have franchise in the world. If we move over 3.5 billion people, it's over 60%. When 60% of the population speaks, believe me, every political leader will be on it like he's an environmental supercharged man <laughs> or woman, you know? Yeah, yeah, yes. Well, I agree. I hope so. Um, Sadhguru, I know, I know you want to... Um, I know Isha and yourself, you're working with the music community in a big way to, to help, help get your message out there. Um, me and, and Brian's got great experience, obviously, of, of, of the role of kind of art and culture and music getting involved in getting the message out. How, how can we help? See, uh, music influencers are probably among the biggest influencers in the world. But compared to cinema, sport, I feel music can move more people than anything else. Right now, uh, we are trying to make some music, some musicians uh, from particularly from the African-American community in uh, United States are supporting us big time. In India, all the musicians are supporting us. We would like to get the English and the European musicians going because if they give out a word or if they even do a small jig for safe soil, the idea is, see, we are not asking people to support us. They don't have to support me. What they have to do is from March 21st, 100 days when this ride is on, this 30,000 kilometers I'm doing in approximately 100 days' time, these hundred days, the whole world should talk about soil. We have certain arrangement with the social media platforms. They will aggregate all these numbers. At the end of it, they'll say, this many people have spoken about soil. So I'm saying if music influencers speak out and say to all their fans, say something about soil every day for one minute, say something about soil. So if you don't know anything, just say, save soil, <laughs> all right, let us make it happen, something. <laughs> Our website is providing a whole array of information for people to pick it up and say whatever they want to say. They don't have to acknowledge us, they don't have to acknowledge my movement, what I'm doing, this is not necessary. They speak, but all of us speak in a concerted way at a given time, that is, in these hundred days, if everybody speaks, then we definitely can. Now, I've been speaking to the CARICOM, which is the Caribbean nations, uh, there's an organization there. Yesterday, I spoke to them. Eleven of these nations are actually signing up for the, you know, with signing up an MOU for the soil, say, Save Soil Movement and the document that we're giving them. So, similar things we want to do with all small nations. Big nations will have their own policies and stuff. We don't want to dictate any terms to anybody. All we are saying is, do whatever kind of farming you want to do. Only thing is, you have to ensure a minimum of three to six percent organic content is there in the soil because this is our responsibility for all the life and the future generations of human beings. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And do you have... I'm just thinking about musicians, the musicians that I know, for example. What would be really nice is for them to have a straightforward package that they can address. Some people are going to want to get into this in depth, good. Some people aren't going to, they're going to want to just have the... The simplest thing they can do is, if the... <laughs> you know, today everybody is doing selfie shoots and whatever, they can hold their own phone in front of them and shoot themselves and say something about supporting safe soil movement and how everybody should talk about it for a hundred days to make this... The, to change the narrative on the planet, See, soil is not just another material, it's life-making stuff. We are made out of it. The question is only this, will we get it now or will we get it when somebody buries us down in the soil? When will we get it? So if the musicians say in their own words, save soil, let us make it happen, uh, conscious planet, you know, soil, our very body, whatever they want to say. But we are using a few terms so that it can be easily aggregated, if the save soil word is there, We'll aggregate it in the social media and bring it up to the government. See, this many people in your country <coughs> want this to happen, will you really ignore this point? So, 
If they can make some, like some musicians are making their own songs and releasing it, that is fine with us, that's great actually. But if not everybody is willing to do that, just one minute, a video that they can shoot on their own phone, they don't need to spend any money, just one minute if they invest, they can do wonders for the world. Uh, I, th I think there'll be quite a few people would be very happy to do that. I mean, you're, you're ste stepping on fertile soil here because everybody wants to do so. Everybody knows things, something needs to be done, you know, so. Uh, what I'm seeing, Brian, is uh, last eight months non-stop, I've been meeting and talking people endlessly. What I see is whether it's heads of state, other politicians, music influencers, sport influencers, movie influencers, every kind of people, whoever I talk to, Everybody says this must be done. So what I see, the whole world knows this needs to be done. It looks like they were just waiting for one idiot to bell the cat, and here I am <laughs> <laughs> Well done, yeah, good. I'm sixty-five and I'm doing thirty thousand kilometers. Hope I survive this ride <laughs> It'll be such fun. <laughs> the thing is, I'm getting the, you know, northern European uh, winter. Maybe I hope the roads are not icy. On a motorcycle, it's not a great thing to do. Then I'm into, in the month of May, I'm in the Saudi desert, uh, where temperatures are 38 to 40 degrees. And then I'm going straight into the uh, Indian monsoon. In the middle of the monsoon, I'm entering India. Absolutely. Okay, well, every success to you. I wish you... No, no, don't, don't wish me success. This is not my planet, this is our planet. Okay. I wish us success then. Let's make it happen, Brian. Yeah. Pete, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Namaskar. Pete, wonderful seeing you again, man. Thank you, Sagaru. I'll yep. see you in London. Yep, we will. Thank you.